Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Section 5. Stranger in a Strange Land, the Saga of Cabeza de Vaca. Brandon Seal, who will be giving our presentation, was born in Abilene and raised in San Antonio. He currently serves as a president of Howard Energy Mexico, director of the Texas Lyceum, and honorary commander of the Inter-American Air Forces Academy. With degrees in philosophy, law, and business, he, he writes and records stories about Texas-Mexico borderland and publishes a podcast, and I invite you to listen to them because they're fascinating, um, from, uh, from his, his new history of old Texas. And Brandon is a man of many talents, and he's going to be talking about uh, the first European to encounter our native Texans and to live and write about it. And as an archaeologist, that saga is so important in terms of a story that we're trying to write through the material culture. I'm really excited about hearing this because I know Brandon has done a lot of work on this. He's a man of many talents. Uh, and I, it is my pleasure to introduce Brandon Seal. Well, good morning and, and thank you again for, for having me here. And the joke that Professor Porter was making before I started too is the last time I tried to talk about this, it took me about 12 hours. That's, are you getting some echo here? Is this good? It took about 12 hours in podcast form, so I'm going to condense it here into 35 or 40 minutes. And in fact, I'm going to assume, if you're here at a Texas History Conference, that you have some passing familiarity with Cabeza de Vaca and his journey. So I'm going to be able to just hit the highlights, because I really want to get to a moment about six or seven years into his journey that I think is, is a unique moment, uh, a unique insight into the worldview of the Native Americans that he's living amongst. Because his account still is an account from a European's perspective. But what I'm actually going to argue is we can actually see some of the Native Americans' worldviews and mythologies kind of impressed upon his account. So, high level, uh, Cabeza de Vaca, born in 1488 uh, to a family of middling nobility uh, back in, in Castile. Uh, he's born in Jerez de la Frontera. And so both the year that he's born and the place that he's born are, 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 are kind of watershed critical moments. So obviously 1488 is just a few years before 1492, which is both the, the ultimate, the, the, the end of the reconquest of the Iberian Peninsula by the Catholic monarchs of, of Castile over the, the Muslim Emirate of Granada. But it's also, of course, the opening of the New World. And Jerez de la Frontera, as its name suggests, it, it, in Spanish, it means Jerez of the border. It sat for 200 years on the border of this conflict with the Muslim kingdoms, but then also, too, with the opening of the New World, all of this traffic, actually, there was, it was, it was, there was a royal monopoly that gets established in Sevilla, in Seville, which is right next to Jerez de la Frontera. So all of the trade that's going on through the New World is actually coming through this area, too. So all around Cabez de Vaca, for his youth, are these stories of, of, of conquest and of exploration of the New World. Um, his parents die when he's young, but, but he's still brought up in, in a pretty has a pretty typical upbringing for, for, for a man of his class. He, he's attached to a, a powerful family in Seville, the, the Duke of Medina uh, Sidonia, Sidonia. And he, uh, he fights in the King's Wars in Italy. He fights and he puts down some rebellions in, in, back in Castile. Uh, and by 1522, he's actually married pretty well for himself. But also by 1522, all of the wealth of the New World, all of the wealth of the Indies has started to flood back into Seville. So recall, 1519 is the Cortez lands in, in, in Mexico, 1521, Tenochtitlan Falls, and it's just th this torrent of wealth. All of a sudden, men of modest means but immodest ambitions are being you know, up-jumped in class. Cortez actually was pretty close in age to Cabeza de Vaca, uh, and he was actually of a slightly lower rung of, of nobility. And, and you know, he's on his way to being, being named a duke, of, of, uh, raised up to the dignity of a duke. And so anyway, this captures the imaginations of all the young men in, and, and some young women too in, in Castile at this time. And so in 1526, Cabeza de Vaca gets his chance. In 1526, he is appointed the royal treasurer on the Panfilo de Narvaez expedition. Panfilo Narvaez was a, was a rival of, of, uh, of, of Cortez's who go, goes back to Spain or go, goes back to Castile. We should be careful here. Spain doesn't actually exist for several hundred more years, technically speaking. Um, but goes back and he gets the commission for, for effectively North America. He gets the commission from the king to go settle the, the, the territory they call La Florida, the Florida, which actually at this time extends pretty much the entire northern rim of the Gulf of Mexico. So Cabeza de Vaca, 
and 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 he's he, he's the royal treasurer, so he's kind of you know the, the king's personal appointee on what is otherwise kind of a private expedition. Not vice and other other investors or what fund this. And very famously, of course, the Narvaez expedition does not go very well. So they depart Spain or they depart the Iberian Peninsula in 1527. Uh, at their first port of call in the Caribbean at Santo Domingo, 140 of the 600 men jump ship. They bail and kind of go find other jobs in the boomtown envi environment of the Caribbean. About 60, 60 more of the men die from a hurricane that actually hits the fleet off the coast of, of, of Cuba, destroys two ships and 60 of the men. And, and then actually when they do try and sail from Cuba, they're trying to sail over to Panuco, which is basically modern day Tampico. But they get tossed and turned in, in, in this storm and for, for 50 days and nights. And by the time they finally sight, sight land on April 10th, 1528, they've actually sighted the western coast of Florida. They still think that it's the eastern coast of Mexico, however. They're terribly disoriented, and, and they really won't figure this out for, for years. I mean, it, 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 it scrambles them entirely, and it almost makes this, you know, it, it, it feels like the opening of some kind of, you know, hokey, magical, realistic movie or something like that. You know, that they're, they're, they're tossed and turned through the storm and spit out onto the shore. Well, again, it doesn't go much better for them on land either. So once they're on land in Florida, they spend, uh, uh, there's 300 men is all that's left to kind of disembark and only about half of the horses they had brought along. They spend about three months chasing rumors of corn and gold throughout Florida, throughout the, the inland part of Florida. They lose another 60 men along the way too to disease and to, and to hostile natives who aren't glad to see them there because their only previous encounters with Spaniards had been slaving expeditions. So by, by, by September of 1528, there's only about 240 of, of these men left. They make their way back to the shoreline and they realize that they've lost contact with their ships. They have no way to reestablish contact with, with, their, with their supply chain effectively too because that was their real advantage, was their logistical and supply chain advantage and that's cut off from them. But again, you know, these are, these are the go-ahead men of their age. They're si se puede kind of guys. You know, they, they, they don't give up. They take all the iron they can, all, all, all the armor, the swords. They hammer them into nails. They, they fell trees. They, make, they fashion these rafts. So they spend two months basically rigging up these rafts. Uh, and, and raft is a generous use of the term because the, 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 these, these crafts that they create ultimately, they're not, they're not watertight at all. The only reason they float is because of the buoyancy of the logs. So the, the, these rafts are like 45 feet long, maybe 15 feet wide. There's 50, about 50 men to a raft. They make five rafts for the 240 or so survivors that are left, which basically, if you do the math, gives every person about as much room as a, a, as a yoga mat. They get on there, these things they talk about, they're barely floating above the water line. They're basically a hand, a hand length above the water line as they're floating. And so November 1528, they trust their fates to the Gulf of Mexico and they start floating along. Well, again, their luck follows them into the Gulf as well. So after about a week, they're out of fresh water, they're out of food, they're out of options. All along the shoreline, they can see smoke signals going up from <laughs> as, as these native tribes are kind of warning their brethren that, hey, you know, there's, there's bad news coming, you know, and so, so what that means is all the natives pull back from the coast. So there's no one even for, for, for these expeditionaries to, to trade with or, or to raid for that matter either. The, the, well, I take that back. There is one tribe that actually comes out to greet them, that receives them and kind of brings them in very generously. And, and then it turns out to be a trap. <laughs> they, they kind of turn on them and send them fleeing back into their rafts. And so, you know, this goes on for about five weeks. And by the end of these five weeks, the, the, these guys are just, they're sacks of bones. I mean, that's literally, you could describe it. You could count the bones on, 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 the, on their bodies. And it's, it's, it's almost, w w what hits them next is almost like a Greek Sisyphean torture or something like this. So five weeks, they have no fresh water. They have no fresh water. They're floating along the coast. And then suddenly someone realizes that the water in front of them, the water that they're floating through along the Gulf here is fresh water. And they test it and they test it and they can't believe it. And then they put down a sounding line and try and find bottom. And suddenly, whereas before they had kind of stayed the whole time in about six feet of water, just because it allowed them to almost like a gondola kind of keep pushing along and keep control of their, their shoddy crafts, they realize that they can't find bottom. They, they, they drop 100 feet of sound, 180 feet of sounding line and they can't find bottom. Well, they've hit, they've, they're coming across the mouth of the Mississippi River right here. So suddenly they have more fresh water than they could ever use. And in fact, some of the guys drink so much that they're, they're bloated and they can't even function. But it's also the current the current of the Mississippi River, they realize, is so powerful. They spend two days and nights paddling against this current, trying to fight against it, but to no avail. You know? So by the third day, they wake up in the morning, and they're out of sight of land. They're out of sight of each other. These five rafts have been scattered to the winds, basically. So by the fourth night, they've essentially almost kind of given up on everything. You know, they, they, they talk about, Cabeza de Vaca talks about on his raft, there was only two men that were left conscious by the time they went to sleep on the fourth night. Again, they haven't eaten in, in weeks. They haven't had fresh water. Well, they had fresh water, but they got too much of it, you know, the, the day before. And so they're woken, however, on the morning of, after the fifth night of this or the fifth day of this, 
by the sound of breakers in the distance, and then suddenly they're thrust onto the shoreline of modern-day Galveston Island. And here, I forgot one of my photos here. And here, <laughs> they, uh, you know, all they can do at this point is crawl. There's only a few men that can actually even walk at this point, you know, and so they, they kind of crawl onto the shoreline. They make a, a half-hearted attempt to, 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 to push their vessel, their, their raft back out into the surf, but, but the, the waves just send it crashing back down. And actually in the process of this, they lose what's left of their clothes. They had taken their clothes off to try and keep them dry. But so then when the raft finally gets overturned, they lose all their clothes too. So now they're literally, you know, naked, starving, <laughs> you know, they, they, all of their weapons are gone too. So all they, all they can do is kind of sit and huddle on the shoreline. It's, it's, it's sometime, you know, December or something like this in, in 1528. It's cold. And then, you know, para el colmo de los males, you know, like the, for, just to put the icing on the cake, they look up on the dunes and a hundred natives <laughs> show up there. And they, they, they're, they're huge. They recall them. They say they looked like giants. And again, there, there, there's some historical record of this too, that the natives of the Texas coast actually were, were, were quite tall, but they have, you know, long bows that are as long as they are. And it's, they don't know, they don't know what can happen next. And something changes here at this moment in the story, or maybe something changes in Cabeza de Vaca. And there's kind of even a debate amongst, amongst the men here on, on, the, on the shore. I mean, sh sh should they fight these guys? Should they try and run? Like, what should they try and do? And, 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 and it's Cabeza de Vaca, at least according to his own account, uh, although he co-writes his account actually with, with uh, two of his other surviving companions, so there's presumably, it's not totally fiction. But so Cabeza de Vaca, who is this great war hero from Italy, who's, you know, raised on these great stories of romantic, you know, combat, Amadis of Gaul and stuff like this, he takes a different approach. He, he realizes his nakedness, he realizes his vulnerability, and he just kind of leads with it. He goes up to the, native, to, to the natives standing there. He walks up to them. The Cavoques is, is the tribe as they call themselves, the Cavoques. He goes up to them and, and through hand signs tries to communicate what has kind of happened to them. I mean, it, it should have been, it was evident that something bad had happened to them, but he still tries to kind of communicate this with hand signs and it works. He's able to communicate and he knows it works because they start crying. <laughs> the natives actually start crying when they understand what, what, what he's telling them what, and what's going on, which is a remarkable reaction too, because I mean, these guys still are kind of interlopers on, on, on an island of pretty limited resources, you know, but, but it's just, it, 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 it elicits just this emotional response and it kind of reinforces for Cabeza de Vaca a different strategy. You know, the, the strategy that he's going to use, he and his, his, his other companions are going to use to survive the next eight years of their stay in North America, because we're really only at the beginning here. This is 1528, and he's going to be there till 1536. And so, but I'm going to fly through some of these next years because, like I said, I really want to get to this moment for further, further along in the story. And so uh, the... Of the original 300 expeditionaries who, who, who landed in Florida, there's only going to be four, really, that survive even the first few years. You've got Cabeza de Vaca, you've got Andres Dorantes, and you've got Alonso Castillo, and you've got Esteban, who is described as, quote-unquote, a black Arab. He's, he, he's a black man. We don't know quite his lineage, but there's various references to him being from, from somewhere from northern, Afri northern Africa. And he actually was Andres. He came to the New World as Andres Dorantes' as a slave, one, one of the other survivors. So, so these four, basically for the next six years are gonna survive essentially almost by handing themselves over to a form of slavery. I mean, it's, they describe it as slavery. Slavery is a bit strong. I mean, it's, they're working for room and board in a world of very limited resources. <laughs> you know, I mean, they're, they're sharing the starvation of their keepers or, or, or of their masters. And, uh, and actually the, the, the highlight, they're doing the work. Unfortunately, they're kind of useless, even as slaves in the New World, at least initially. They don't know how to forage. They don't know how to hunt in this landscape. You know, they don't know what to look for. And so they're, they're reduced, and this is Cabeza de Vaca's language, you know, they're pushed into doing, you know, essentially women's work around the camp. You know, they're having to scrape hides and to do those kind of things. And, um, you know, and another version of women's work, too, and this is actually a highlight for Cabeza de Vaca of these years, he becomes a bit of a merchant. He becomes a trader, kind of going back and forth amongst some of the inland tribes and the coastal tribes, hawking various wares, you know, red ochre and seashells and, and stuff like this. But again, too, it, it, in, in the cultures of those times, men didn't do that. Men, men were, were viewed as hostile. And, and there's a great book by Juliana Barr, you know, that talks about this idea of that peace comes in the form of a woman, that in, in these early Texas tribes, women were often the bearers of peace and the bearers of trade and, and those kind of things, too. But again, it's a role that Cabeza de Vaca falls into. And so uh, the, one of the things that Cabeza de Vaca observes very early on and, and I, I think he may have observed this in particular as a trader, if, if, if he's trading some of these goods, was 
the unique role that medicine men, that, that shamans played in these cultures. So these medicine men, Cabeza de Vaca and his companions observed, they didn't have to work. You know, they, they were allowed to take multiple wives instead of a single wife. When, when they died, they were burned instead of buried. And, uh, and importantly, too, of course, being a medicine man, you don't just get to be a medicine man. You know, you have to be able to cure people, to, to be able to heal people. And what they observed, too, is that when they, when they perform a successful cure, they're paid quite handsomely by, the, by, by their, their patients. They're, I mean, the, the going rate for, for, for a cure is the person basically gives the doctor, gives the medicine man everything they own, which, which feels like it invites a joke to, that's about what it costs today to get healed for most things too, for most doctors. But like, you know, I, I think the idea is, is you know, you've, you've given that person back their life. And so everything you have is, is, it becomes the property of the medicine man at that point. And so, uh, and, and, and there's also something about Cabeza de Vaca and Dorantes and Castillo and, and, uh, and, and Esteban that, that seems to make some of the natives want to believe that they might be medicine men. And it's, it's, that's not hard, too hard to imagine. They just looked so different. I mean, you've got three pale-skinned, bearded guys, one very dark-skinned, also bearded guy. They just looked, Native Americans hadn't seen anything like these guys before. And so very early on on Galveston Island, there's actually a first instance of where the natives try to, 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 to get the expeditionaries to be faith healers. So again, this part of the tragedy of this exchange here, when Cabeza de Vaca and his raft land on the island and the natives take them in very, and, and, and care for them and feed them, unfortunately, there's an exchange of diseases. <laughs> and uh, actually it, it kills off, in this case, it actually kills off more of the, the, the old worlders than it does the new worlders. It kills off something like 80% of the expeditionaries and about 50% of the natives. And again, you know, it's probably because the expeditionaries were in such a, a weakened state already. But this disease is running rampant through the camp. And the caboques, the locals, basically say to Cabeza de Vaca, all right, you guys brought this problem. You need to fix it. Here's some stones. We want you to rub these, these stones, pass these warm stones over, over the sick people. Here's some sharper knives. We want you to make some incisions, or, you know, draw blood effectively from, from some of these other people and you know, say the right words and fix them. And at first, the expeditionaries think they're kidding. They start laughing. They start saying, like, yeah, that, that's not how healing works. And they say, like, you know, you heal them or you die. You know, like it was, it was a very simple proposition at that point. And so they do, they take it seriously. And, and they, they, they perform this very beautiful syncretic ceremony of they wait till, till, uh, till, till sundown, till, till the, the, the sun is going down. They basically kind of perform like a mass. You know, they, they, they repeat some Pater Nosters and some Ave Marias. They pass the warm stones over the victims. They, they incise them a little bit with the knives and they finish with a big sign of the cross. And it worked and it healed them. And the expeditionaries are as surprised by this as anyone. I mean, and they, they don't quite know what to do with it. They don't quite know what to make of this. They take this power very, very seriously. And it kind of scares them, frankly. They, they, they kind of tuck it away and they, they, they won't pull it out again for several more years. And you know, partly because too, they just become consumed then at just trying to, the day-to-day -day facts of, of, of trying to stay alive and, and find enough to eat. But by the summer of 1834, they'd had enough. You know, they, 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 they'd lived this meager existence. They'd made their way a little bit down the coast from Galveston. By this time, they're somewhere probably in South Texas, maybe around Brooks County, Hebronville, you know, kind, kind of something in that area. Um, and, and again, it's, it's still pretty hand to mouth. And so what they decide in the summer of 1534 is they're going to wait for the big prickly pear harvest, the big prickly, which, which is kind of the only time of real bounty in, in that region uh, during the year, which if you know anything about it, is also in the, like, the middle of summer, middle of August. I mean, just the, hot, the hottest part of the year. But they were, gonna, they were gonna do that because they could take this bounty, they could dry some of the prickly pears, and at least they could move a little bit. They, they could have some mobile provisions that, that they could take with them. And so they decide September 1534, they're gonna make their way south. They still have some notion in their head that if they go south far enough, they'll reconnect with, with New Spain, with Cortez's settlement down there. They're gonna do that or they're gonna die trying. And so they kind of sneak away from, from, from their keepers. They sneak away from, from the, tribe that, the tribes that had been keeping them. And they, they come upon the first new tribe, a first new tribe where, where they're kind of unknowns. And, you know, historically they had gone up to these tribes and essentially offered themselves over as, as beggars, as beggars or as servants or as slaves or whatever, but they tried a different strategy in this case. And there's even a suggestion that it may have been Esteban who, who, who came up with this idea. It, 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 they always sent Esteban ahead first because he was the most distinctive looking, but also because Esteban seemed to have a real aptitude for languages and, and for being able to find ways to communicate. So they send him ahead first and he seems to tell this, this, this village, this, this community, that four great medicine men are coming. Not four beggars, you know, four great medicine men are coming. <laughs> so he's changed the expectation to begin with. And it kind of works, you know, when they show up, they certainly look like nothing else this tribe has ever seen before. They, they, they show up and, 
and and the tribe is thrilled. I mean, it's like celebrities are in town. You know, it's 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 a it's a rock band has showed up or something, or at least that's that's what they've been told. Now, again, of course, the challenge is you can't just say you're a medicine man. You have to actually be able to heal. <laughs> and so they don't waste any time. The the, the 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 tribesmen pull up, you know, five of their of, of their of their of their companions who are sick, and they bring them before these four new self-proclaimed medicine men. And again, same deal. They, they kind of fall back on this ritual that they had performed a few years before. They, 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 they take some warm stones. They, they take the things that they've observed over the last six years, that they've seen the, the native shaman, the native medicine men doing. They copy that and they blend it again at sunset, you know, at, the, at that liminal hour. And they blend it with, with their own kind of liturgy and with their own mass. And they go through it. And it's, multi, it's a multi, many hours long. This isn't like an abracadabra kind of thing. I mean, this is something where they, they conduct a full ceremony. Because part of what... What seems to be going on too is that they, they believe that God has to be present to, to make these cures work. And, and, and they believe that God has to want them to heal. And they believe that they have to deserve you know, God's, God's power to move, to move through them. And in fact, at first when they hesitate to cure, one of the reasons they say that their reluctance comes from is because they're, they're afraid that their sins might interfere with their ability to cure. Like they're taking this very, very seriously. And they feel like they need to do kind of this, this, this purification before they can do it. But once again, they do this incredible ceremony. And the five, the five natives are healed. Again, it works. And again, the afflictions are unclear. It's, it's always a little unclear what exactly the afflictions is. Because again, the quantity of people that they're encountering that apparently are needing some kind of cure, I think you know, scholars have written about all kinds of different theories. Is it just psychosomatic? Or is, 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 it, is it typhus? Like, do they have some kind of you know, European disease? Or, or is it just like psychological even? I don't know. It's a little unclear. We can't quite figure out what it is. But if nothing else, the, the, the performance of it seems to, be, seems to do something, and it seems to create this effect. And it's certainly Kabez de Vaca and his companions' belief that this is what's allowing them to, to survive and to keep moving at this point, too. Because word starts to spread. Word starts to spread that these guys are here somewhere, and, and by now they're not quite to the Rio Grande, maybe. They're somewhere, you know, Star County, Texas, something like this. That, that, that there's these four incredible medicine men, and people start coming from all around. And what helps with this, too, is that Cabez de Vaca and his companions, there's another part to their strategy, which is a little bit unique. When they get paid by their, their patients for their cures, they actually turn around and give it all back away to the people around them, which, which is remarkable for a couple points, too. For one, in their first cure, one of the gifts they get is, is dried venison. And they don't even know what it is because they haven't seen protein in so long. <laughs> At first, they don't know what it is. So these, these guys who have been starving and have been, been you know, living in, in such scarcity for so long that they're able to then turn around and, I mean, I would become a hoarder. You know what I mean? If I hadn't eaten good in, in, in six years, I don't know that I would have that magnanimity of spirit to be able to, to turn around. But, but again, it, it creates almost like a, a bit of a pyramid I don't want to say scheme, but you know, it, it creates a strong incentive for people to keep supporting them and to keep coming to them. And, and, and soon they have a group of followers and, and it grows. First it's in the dozens and then it's in the hundreds and then it's in the thousands. Literally at one point they say they have thousands of people following them, they're gathered around them. And there's some credibility to this. By the time they actually get back to New Spain, the, the, the Spanish accounts talk about how there's, the Castilian accounts talk about, talk about how there's 600 natives behind them at that point. So there, there seems to be some credibility to this. But I got sidetracked a little bit there. Um, so, you know, suddenly you, you have these four expeditionaries who for six years had been stuck on the, the, stuck in South Texas, unable to move at any appreciable speed. And suddenly they're the most, they're the most sought after medicine men on the continent. And the speed of things starts to pick up. Like we talked about the building their entourage and starting to move. Now, now they're able to move, you know, much more quickly through the countryside. But all of this, all of this fame and all of this new kind of material wealth, it, it, it still can't protect Cabeza de Vaca from the, the more dangerous elements of the Texas landscape. And so one night or one evening when he's out, out foraging or out kind of on his own, he's separated from his band. And, and, he, and, and as the sun starts to go down, he can't find them. And, and, and he kind of panics. You know, you, obviously being alone is a terrible thing in, 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 in South Texas, uh, in the South Texas wilderness. And, 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 and he doesn't know what to do. So he kind of, even as after night falls, he's still wandering around, still trying to find traces of these, of, 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 of these companions. And... He also points out to us again here that he's, at this moment, it's a strange that he, he recalls this for us, just, just to set the scene, you know, that he's still naked as the day I was born. Desnudo como nasi, naked as the day I was born. And, but then in the distance, he sees like a glow. He sees a faint glow. And so he starts going toward it. You know, it kind of looks like a campfire or something, but you know, he's very cautious. He doesn't know whose it is. He starts trying to listen for voices. But as he gets closer, he realizes there's, there's no voices around it. There's no people around it. And he walks up to it, and it's a tree that's on fire. It's a hand of God burning bush in the middle of the South Texas Monte. And so he walks up to it. He, he by the way, doesn't, doesn't 
emphasize for us the obvious biblical parallel. He, he just kind of keeps describing it matter-of-factly. He goes up to it. He, he's able to, you know, pull off some of the, the flaming, the, 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 the burning branches and, and takes them with him. And that night he's able to dig a little hole for himself and, and he makes four little fires around him, you know, in, like in the shape of a cross, you know, one on all side. He pulls some grass in over himself kind of as a blanket. And for the next five days and nights, this, this is his routine. He'll walk around, he'll keep these embers lit. At night, he'll dig his little hole and, and he'll make his fires around himself again. But he, he still can't find his band, but, but he keeps doing this. And you know, this is what allows him to survive. But then on the fifth night, as he's sleeping, one of the fires throws a spark. It throws a spark and it catches the grass that, that, that's, that he puts on top of himself on fire. And he doesn't wake up until like his hair is on fire and he's partly burned and he comes kind of leaping out of the hole and he's having to, you know, pat himself to put this fire out and, you know, he barely survives it. And it's memorable for him. And he says it'll leave him scarred even for, 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 for years later. But, but he finds his band the next day. He finds his, his, his three companions and, he, and he's reunited with them. And, and, and he, he, as he tells the story of, of, of what happened, you know, I think the parallel to Moses is, is obviously, you know, self-evident. I think his three companions would, would have gotten the burning bush parallel immediately. But what I think is even more interesting, and I want to dive deep on right here, is what he had actually gone through, what his Native American listeners, I think, would have heard was him recounting the quintessential Native American underworld rebirth story, a story that, that, that the people of the Coahuiltecan Plains of, of northern Mexico and south Texas had actually been telling for thousands of years. How do I know this? Or on what basis am I, am I making this claim? So at a couple points in my podcast, I've incorrectly lamented the fact that we don't really have primary accounts from the Native Americans, you know, at, at least pre-contact primary, primary accounts of their lives. But that's not strictly true. And there's really no better place to talk about this than here at the Witty, which is to talk about the rock art panels. That in the, nestled in the canyons of the Lower Pecos, in the, uh, Lower Pecos uh, River are hundreds of these rock art panels, which again, you can go right, right next door or upstairs, upstairs actually and, just, and, and kind of see these. And I'll talk, this is from White Shaman, I'll, I'll, which is one that's featured upstairs too. And I'll talk about this a little bit. Uh, but these things, they're, they're in some cases 150 feet long, you know, 15 feet high. They're, they're, they're enormous compositions of real complexity. And you know, it, it, at first glance, I think when you first see them, it's hard to know what to make of them. And it almost looks, I mean, like just, is it just scribblings or, you know, the, 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 the peyotist hallucinaz hallucinaz hallucinations of, of Stone Age artists or some, something like that. But there's a lot more to it. And the clues are in the compositional complexity. For one, when you go and actually analyze the pigments that they use, they're using items and resources that are scarce. The, the binder for their paint is deer fat. And we just talked about how rare deer fat and, you know, deer and, and protein and stuff like that was in these people's diets. These people are sacrificing resources from their diet to be able to create these paints. Also an interesting fact I find is that the paints are almost always applied in the same order, the, the different colors. I can't remember the order now, but you know, it's, it, they're all red, yellow, black, and white. And they're all applied in the same order in almost every, in almost every composition. They've gone back and, and been able to analyze this, which means that if you know the order that those are applied and you're used to seeing them that way and you're a contemporary, you can sit down and look at those and you can almost see them in 3D. You know that the red was on the scene first and then the yellow shows up and then the black and then the white. So they're almost three, they're, they're movies. They're effectively, you know, Stone Age movies, you know, relating events that are important enough to the people of this region that they're sacrificing their, their, their nutritional resources to be able to record them. So let's talk about a few of the themes that, that, that are some of the most consistent in these. And, and again, the reason this is relevant too is this is exactly the reason that the region that Cabeza de Vaca is going through about this time in his narrative. He's going through, he's crossing the Rio Grande. He's, he, he, he crosses the Rio Grande and kind of then tracks up through, uh, through Nuevo Leon, up into Coahuila, and then somewhere around Coahuila too, crosses back over in the Big Bend region. And so right in the region of, of where most of this rock art is found. So one of the main themes that we see in this rock art uh, is crenellated arches is, is the term. I'm, I'm using uh, Carolyn Boyd's terminologies from, from some of her work on this stuff. The crenellated arch, which you can see right there, it's, it's, it's prominent in a bunch of these works. And it, it, it's interesting because it often, it often almost looks like it's, it's imposed on top of the work if you, if, you don't, if, if you don't know how to contextualize it. It looks like it's almost kind of thrown in there or dissecting the work or something like this. But the suggestion seems to be of this crenellated arch that it's suggestive of the, the layered nature of the worldview that, 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 that these natives seem to, 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 to have in their head, this idea of a subterranean, a superficial, and a spiritual world. And the arch seems to kind of rep represent that boundary, which by the way, too, is also why these are frequently found in caves and in rock shelters. You know, those are also the kind of those, uh, you know, archetypal liminal spaces, you know, between the subterranean and, 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 and the surface. Okay, another 
theme that you're going to see a lot is these skeletonized shamans, like this guy right here. They're depicted often as almost without, without any meat on their bones, you know, and, 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 you know, the idea seems to be that they're, they're figures that have learned how to see themselves through to their core. They're figures that have learned how to see themselves, you know, through to their own nakedness, you know, as it were. And you'll often see them here too, kind of bursting through these boundary layers, bursting through the boundary layers. And, you know, they're able to cross between the, the, the layered worldview, between the subterranean and the superficial, between the spiritual and, and, and the material. And often too, by the way, they're often depicted holding kind of like the larger black figure there, depicted with like a flaming head or like with, with torches in each hand or flaming torches in each hand. All right, who does that sound like? <laughs> so go back to the story I just told you about Cabeza de Vaca, you know, sleeping in his hole and, 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 and coming bursting out of that hole with his hair on fire, carrying his firebrands around the, around the countryside. Oh, and I forgot to mention this too. So the, the, the number five is sacred in this region's tradition. There, there's actually even, there, there's, there's a, uh, an, an Aztec word or a Nahuatl word for their god of fire, uh, Nayakuitli, Naya, Nayatequitli. And, and the idea, Nayatequitli refers to the group of four where the fifth component is the group itself. You know, anyway, just the idea being that, that five is some sacred number. Well, remember, five nights was how many nights Cabeza de Vaca was out there. Look at his group. He is part of a group of four. He, he and his companions are a group of four traveling as a unit, making that, that, that fifth group. So it's, uh, what, what, I'm, what, what I'm starting to feel or what I'm starting to hear here, it's almost, if you're a Native American listener to this, and if this interpretation of some of this imagery is correct, when Cabeza de Vaca comes back from his, his misadventure out there in the monte, it's, it's almost like he's, he's walked out of the rock art panels, you know, and into real life, you know, is, is what I think it would have sounded like. And I can keep going too. So here's kind of a third theme that, 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 that shows up through, through a lot through these. It's, it's serpents, the theme of serpents. Serpents play, play a critical role here. And this is interesting too for me. In Cabeza de Vaca's account, right after he tells the story of being lost in the monte and returning to his tribe, he makes an interesting analogy. He talks about how they, they, they suffered greatly from, from, from kind of the, the, the heat and the sun and the work and the prickly thorns that, that they, had to, you know, they had to forage through in the South Texas brush country. And he refers to it. He, he says that they shed their, their, their skin twice a year like snakes, which is an interesting image. And then he also goes on to say, too, he talks about how the, the thorns, how painful they were. And the, the only thing that, 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 that bore him through this was, was thinking of how Jesus' pain must have been so much greater with his crown of thorns and on the cross. And it's, it's an interesting juxtaposition because you've got the serpent. You know, it's immediately recalling the story of the Garden of Eden and, and, and this image of, of, of original sin juxtaposed immediately, not only with the image of Jesus as the redeemer of original sin, but also with Jesus at the moment of the redemption, you know, on the cross with the crown of thorns and things like that. Well, let me take it here to the Native American tradition, going back to the serpents and the significance of serpents here. So I'm, I'm going to quote some of these. This, this is from Carolyn Boyd's uh, uh, work here. But okay, so for the, and these are all tribes, these are all uh, Uto-Aztecan Uto speaking tribes, and I'll come back to that in a second, but the, the Yaquis, the, these are relatives, d distant relatives of the Aztecs. Um, uh, the, the Yaquis, quote, entrance and exit to the supernatural world must be made through the mouth of a giant serpent. Here's the Hopis. The serpent serves as the communicator between the earthly world and the world below. The Aztecs often depicted the surface of the earth itself as a serpent. And you can even picture this sometimes in your head or if you've been to some of their temples, you know, you, you can sometimes have, you'll have a large serpent forming like the base of the, of, of the foundation and stuff like this. And the Weechels, who are still active today, the Weechels still today conceive of the world itself as surrounded by a sea-like serpent with two heads through which the sun must pass, pass each day. In precisely the way the snake sheds its skin, it is constantly reborn. In the same way as the medicine man who passes from the spirit world to the material world is reborn. In the same way as the central figure of the expeditionary's faith is kind of what I argue here as well. So what, what Cabeza de Vaca is doing is he's using language and imagery from both the Christian and Native American traditions. He's kind of showing off his fluency in both of these traditions, but what it gives us is an insight into his gospel, essentially, or into his, his ministry, you know, what he's saying and, and preaching to these Native Americans. But this kind of helps validate why it would have been working, <laughs> you know, when, when we kind of see similar imagery validated in some of their primary sources in this rock art. All right, so here's another cool detail, too, that, that, that I'll throw out. Um, Cabeza de Vaca only gives us two words from, from Native American uh, grammars, from actually two Native American words, which is also interesting because they encountered all these tribes and they clearly found ways to communicate, but he only preserves two words for us. One of them is araka, which means come here, which I, I can't make anything of. But the second one is interesting. From around this time, he tells us that their word for dog is sho, X-O, sho. And 
if, if you watch Mexican League soccer, like the, the, uh, the, 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 the Tijuana soccer team is the Cholos. The word in Nahuatl for dog is Cholo, just like Xolotl, which is their, their, their native dog deity and traditional guide to the underworld. And so I, like, what, what I can't help but wonder is, is this, were Cabeza de Vaca's followers, native followers, walking around calling him Xo? Like, you know, like, is he their kind of native leader through the monte, through, the, through this, this kind of underworld journey that he's already kind of told us? We're getting a little out there, but for what it's worth, I have talked about this with Carolyn Boyd, and she thinks, she thinks there's something to it. I don't think it's totally crazy. Um, and and well, again, kind of interestingly as well, Shalotl also famously has, is a famous twin in Aztec mythology. And, and, and his, his name even has the context of like a double or a twin, which is a nice transition into this incredible story from Cabeza de Vaca's account of what very obviously seems to be a twin. And so it, it, this is an interesting story too because it takes up three or four pages of a 120 page narrative and it totally disrupts the chronology that, that Cabeza de Vaca is telling. And it, again, it's the only real extended story from Native American myth mythology or worldview that, that he really gives us. So why, like well, why does he decide to preserve this story? And so I, 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 let me just go ahead and read through it and, and then we can count the ways that, that, that it that it sounds familiar. So from the natives account, according to Cabeza de Vaca, it all started 15 or 16 years ago. They told us that a man had gone about in that land whom they called Malacosa, bad thing in English, short haired with a beard, though, it, though his face they could never clearly make out. Just before he arrived at someone's lodge, the occupant's hair would stand on end and they would tremble. And then suddenly Malacosa would appear in the doorway holding burning sticks. He would enter their lodge and take whatever he wanted from them. Then he would make three cuts into their sides with a very sharp rock. Then he would stick his hand into the incisions and remove their intestines, and he would cut off several inches, and the part that he cut off he would throw in the fire. Then he would make three cuts into their arms. Da -da -da. A short while later, he would reset the arm. Da -da -da. They said that many times when they were dancing in their religious ceremonies, he would appear among them, sometimes dressed as a woman, sometimes as a man, and that when he wanted to, he could pick up an entire lodge and lift it in the air and bring it crashing down. They also said that many times they gave him food to eat, but that he never ate, and that when they asked where he came from and where he had his home, he pointed to a hole in the ground and said that his home was down below. So let me count all the ways that this is a doppelganger for Cabeza de Vaca here. I mean, it, it, even from what I've told you, it, hopefully it's already kind of obvious, but so first off, they said it started 15 or 16 years ago. So by now we're in 1535. 15 or 16 years ago takes us to 1519, the year that, that the Castilians landed in New Spain and actually landed also in Panuco, only a few hundred miles south of where we are at this point. Next, the reference to Malacosa as bearded. I mean, that sounds distinctly European. Next, uh, carrying the burning sticks. Who did we just see walking around the countryside with burning sticks? Keep going here. It also sounds a lot like the healing ceremonies that Cabez de Vaca and his companions have started doing, making the incisions with the rocks and, and, and resetting the bones. But there, there's like a cynical component to it here too, where it's almost like Malacosa is creating the injury and then fixing it. So you almost wonder, is this like a veiled critique that's coming through the Native American version of this? Do they view Cabez de Vaca as like causing the problems that he's fixing? You know, you, you, you kind of get this idea too as, as they, as, they uh, uh, as it goes on through some of these other things. But so again, so, uh, Malacosa shows up sometimes dressed like a man, sometimes like a woman. Who else have we seen doing traditional woman's work? Cabeza de Vaca. Let's see. When Malacosa's hosts offer him food, they say, Malacosa often rejects it. Well, who else have we seen declining food? The, 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 the four expeditionaries, they're declining food and giving it away to these other people. And lastly, you know, when they ask where his home is, he points down below the ground. When, well, Cabeza de Vaca is apparently walking around telling people that he digs a hole in the ground to sleep in and emerges out of it. I mean, if on the previous slide, we, we kind of just suspected that Cabeza de Vaca was, was imitating, either consciously or not, some of the, the imagery and the iconography of, of, of this, this Native American worldview in this place, I mean, I argue in this, he is directly telling us <laughs> how he has entered and, and, and kind of adopted, you know, this, this persona, this Native, how he has become a part of Native American mythology almost <laughs> in what he's doing and the story that he's living as he wanders through Mexico. So I'm, I'm going to wrap up here and, you know, just to, to, to not leave you hanging on the story, obviously Cabeza de Vaca does make it back to, to New Spain. He, he, he ends up trekking entirely across the continent, though. He doesn't make it back on the, on the Gulf Coast. He ends up crossing the Continental Divide. They end up over on the Pacific Coast and somewhere around Culiacan, Sinaloa, is actually where he first reunites with, with Castilians. And, and, and if you want to hear more about this, if you want to hear the 12 hour version, please go check out my podcast. You can hear in more detail because I'll even argue too that the moment when he reunites, we, our, our instinct is to want to believe that the climax of the story is when he reunites with his old culture. But I, I argue it's not. I, I argue that actually there's a more important council that comes after that where he really 
is playing, again, this kind of intermediate role between the, the, the European society that he's returned to and between the Native American society, society that he's become kind of a, a, an apostle for. And, and, and that's the real climax of the story, is, is his role as an advocate and as, as an intermediary, kind of like a skeletonized shaman or something, that I think is, is the critical part of the story. And, 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 and that kind of leads me into to where I want to wrap up here, too, is that, you know, basically, the, uh, there's one theme, there's one word that Cabeza de Vaca returns to over and over in, in this story, and it's the word naked nakedness, desnudo, acueros. It shows up dozens of times. I mean, like the only other substantive noun that shows up more is, is God. And, and, and he uses it kind of as a signpost. I mean, he's, he's naked on, on, on the shore of Galveston Island when he arrives there. He's naked in the monte when, when, he's, when he's in the brush in, in his little hole. He's as naked as Adam at a different time. He's as naked as a skeletonized shaman figure. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a dual reminder for us of both his physical vulnerability but also of, of this posture of extreme openness that he adopts in the course of his journeys. And, and you know, that, that uh, starting on, on Galveston Island. And that what, what he actually does, he, it's a survival strategy for him. He makes of himself kind of a blank slate, a tabula rasa. But once you, you, you kind of internalize that idea, you have the exhilarating kind of realization that we can actually then see kind of imprinted on that blank slate, on that tabula rasa, some of the worldview and some of the beliefs of of the people around him, of the pe people that, that he's interacting with. Anyway, that's what I've tried to argue here. So hopefully um, some real scholars can come along and, and continue to dig on this even deeper because I bet there's even more clues. Um, but, but I wanted to share those with you guys today and would love to answer any questions if you have any. So thank you. Oh, sure. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Um, kind of your thesis there uh, about him being, your thesis about him being the connection between the old world and the Native Americans, uh, did you glean most of that from reading his, his memoir? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, the, 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 the primary source for this is his Relacion, or, you know, w w w uh, the account has a couple different names depending on, on, on when it's published. Now, to be clear, too, I've also read a bunch of commentaries of them. So, I mean, I, I, I don't think this isn't me making this assertion. I, I think this is a, an idea, for example, some of the other great books, Andres Resendez, who's a professor at UC Davis, I think, has a great book, a recent one kind of about him playing this intermediate role. And, and there, there's the, the, the big study, there's this three-volume work done by... Um, Adorno, I think she's a Yale professor, and uh, Pouts is the other guy's last name that, that, that really teases a bunch of this stuff out. And so, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the role he comes to adopt is, is, is as this intermediary. And, and what, what I argue he's ultimately doing in his narrative account is he's, he's both kind of showing off a little bit how he was able to obtain fluency in the Native American mythological um, idiom and, and be able to kind of speak that language, but also then too, he's, he's, he's showing Native Americans in the light, in a light that, that his readers back in Castile are going to understand too, because this goes back to the debate that, that Rebecca was talking about a little bit earlier. The debate was very active at this point of, of whether Native Americans were gente con razón, whether they were people of reason, and because and that, and that creates certain rights for them un, under canon law and under, under, under Castilian law. And so he, he's very actively making the argument that they are, that they are people with reason. And, he, and so this is why one of the reasons I think the council scene that comes after his, his reuniting with, his, uh, with the other Castilians is so important because in that council, he shows the Native Americans reasoning, theologically reasoning, you know, making arguments. But, but he's also in that same scene, he's showing his Western audience, his, his Castilian audience, how the pre-existing Native American beliefs could be understood in almost like a, a Christian kind of, kind of way too. So he's, al he's always kind of going back and forth and, and, and translating between, between those, those two worldviews in a really rich and, and literary way. Now I'll say, because of the multi-layered and kind of literary richness of this account, some people are skeptics of, of some of the stuff he says in here. They, they think he, it's too literary. <laughs> you know, it, it leads them to question you know, his, his, uh, his, his veracity or you know, his, his, his truthfulness in, in the individual things he says. And again, some of these things do seem kind of too good to be true. I mean, a, a burning bush <laughs> in the middle of the brush. But then my, my point there too is kind of like, fine, we don't have to accept the factuality of it, but he's, he's using it for some important literary device then too, in which case it still has an important meaning that we need to try and understand. Like what's he trying to signal with that burning bush if it wasn't actually a burning bush?
But by the other token, too, I mean, yeah, there's other people, too, that think they were just charlatans, you know, that they were just, they, they had some kind of carnival show that they were going around and, you know, doing, you know, thumb tricks or something and convincing people that they were, they were healing these natives and that was how they were able to keep moving. But, but I don't see that, you know, I, 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 I there's, there's something genuine about what, what they're doing and what they think they're doing. Just, just like, again, the, there's people who have put cynical spins on the Franciscans and, 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 their, and, their, uh, and their missionary work, you know, that really they were just a tool of Castilian imperialism or something. But when you actually read their language, the Franciscans believed what they were doing. They, they were men of God and in a hurry to meet him. You know, like they, they were not afraid to die, not afraid to, to go out and do what they did. And by the same token, I, I generally take Cabeza de Vaca at his word here. I mentioned this too. His other two Castilian companions, uh, Durantes and Castillo, they also wrote their own reports. We, we've since lost the joint report that the three of them wrote, but we have commentaries of the joint reports. And, and we know that in general, they, they, they tend to coincide in most of the material details. Again, some of the more fantastic ones do only appear in Cabeza de Vaca's account. So, yeah, there's reason to question. Thank you. So Cabeza de Vaca, he makes it back to, to Castile. So he, he, he makes it uh, back to Mexico City in 1536. Um, by 1538, he's back in Castile. And here's the real kicker too. He hasn't seen his wife in, you know, 10 years. He, he, has, he never has children. He'll never have children. As soon as he gets back, he goes to the king and tries to get a commission to come back to North America. He, he wants Narvaez's old commission. He wants to come back. And, 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 and the idea seems to be that he wants to come kind of with this this different kind of conquest. That one of my episodes I, I title, well, and this is a term too that I take from Adorno and Pouts. He wants to accomplish the ideal conquest, a conquest of spirit rather than a conquest of arms. Now he doesn't get, he doesn't get that commission because just a few months before they had given it to uh, De Soto, Hernando De Soto. But he actually does get sent to, uh, to Argentina, basically. He gets sent as the viceroy, or uh, that's not the right word, like the, the adelantado, the, the governor of, of the Rio de la Plata. He goes down there, and his quirks immediately turn off like all the Castilians that are already there. So he, he didn't, he, he, so first off, it took him weeks to be able to learn how to sleep in a bed again. Weeks to be able to learn how to wear a shirt. It, just, it, was, it was scratchy. It was uncomfortable for him. And when he gets down to Argentina, he still refuses to wear shoes. <laughs> like it, it annoys the people around him. And so anyway, he, he gets on their wrong side. They basically send him back to Castile in chains. They, they charge him with all kinds of things. They charge him with corruption. They charge him with, I don't know, all, various other crimes. He spends basically the rest of his life in the legal system fighting it. He's actually initially convicted and sentenced to forced labor in, in Algeria. <laughs> but, uh, but that gets overturned. And it seems that, that he died back in his hometown in Jerez de la Frontera in, in relative some comfort or something. We, the, the, the reason why we suggest he had some comfort was that he was able to actually ransom one of his nephews that I think had been captured by Turkish pirates or something later on. So he still had some kind of means so anyway, but he, he dies back in Castile. We don't know, for, we don't know exactly where, but I think the, the, the strong belief it's back in, uh, in Jerez de la Frontera, where he was born. So. Got a question over here? Yes. Um, I'm thinking about, I, I teach Texas history and Cabeza de Vaca is really important. I don't have a lot of time you know, to, <laughs> to spend on early Texas necessarily, but we spend at least an entire class period on Cabeza de Vaca. Um, I present him, I think, sort of as this alternative to, you know, Nuno de Guzman, some of the enslavers. Yeah. And I, I think I sort of put him in the context of Bartolome de las Casas as these other voices who are speaking out for more humane treatment of the Indians and also for Christianization. And I'm just wondering your thoughts on that, if you think that's the right way to portray him in a class when you have a very limited amount of time. I, totally. I mean, well, de las Casas uses a, a, an early draft of, of the account, actually, in his uh, lobbying for the, the there, there was in 1542, so a couple years after he comes back, is when kind of the, the, the most generous Indian welfare law comes out. They, they technically forbidden Indian slavery back in 1525, um, but there were still a bunch of loopholes that you could, you could jump through. So, so they, 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 1542 was a much more generous, you know, Indian welfare law call, or, that's the wrong word. I, I can't remember the, the, the full name of the act, but De Las Casas is actually using He's using Cabeza de Vaca's account for some of that. Now, that said, I, I think there, there's complexity to it. Like, I don't think you can just make Cabeza de Vaca a saint of this because, again, in his time when he's in Argentina, he's, he's not opposed to enslaving Indians as long as, as you stick to the law. 
And this is one of the things that actually gets him crossways with some of the earlier settlers there is that he, he, he'll refuse to enslave friendly and allied Indians. And th this is kind of what annoys some of his, his other countrymen. But he, he will, you know, Indians that, 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 that they engage in combat with, that they go to war with, he, he's not opposed to, to enslaving those. By the same token, too, the, the way he ends his account, he shows up in Culiacan and he's got 600 natives behind him and you know, of, of his followers. And this actually intimidates the hell out of the guys that he shows up, the, the Castilians that, that receive him there, because the Castilians there are slavers. <laughs> They're actually out there slaving. They're working for Nuno de Guzman. And, uh, and, and they... They're intimidated, and they really, they really want to separate Cabeza de Vaca from his 600 followers, him and, and Durantes and Castillo and Esteban. And at one point, the natives have this incredible scene where they refuse to let Cabeza de Vaca go with the slavers. They're like, no, those are bad guys, Cabeza de Vaca. Like, you, you don't want to go with them. Like, are, are, you're, we know what you are, you know? And there's this, even this beautiful speech that Cabeza de Vaca recreates where the natives and the slavers kind of get in an argument. And the slavers are trying to say, like, look, these medicine men of yours, they're, they're not medicine men. They're just down on their luck Castilians. You know, like, there's nothing special about these guys. <laughs> they're like us. They're, they're like us. They're not like you guys. And, and the natives respond in, in this wonderful speech. They say, they're not like you guys. You guys come and you bring slavery and you bring sickness and you bring disease. You know, you guys came from where the sun rises. They came from where the sun sets. You know, like, they make all these distinctions and it's just a smackdown of an argument. And again, it's him demonstrating natives capable of using reason. But again, it's, it's got for me this very colored finish in the story too, because in as much as Cabeza de Vaca prevents them from enslaving his 600 followers at that moment, at least that's how he presents it. And he, he, when he goes to this council, he describes how it becomes this great moment of peace and how after he finishes the council, everyone agrees to, to be friends and the sons of the Indians are, are baptized and there's crosses that go up in the countryside. And then there's just one peculiar detail of like, after he leaves you with this moment of triumph, of cinematic, you know, Oscar-worthy redemption or whatever, as they walk into Mexico City, he talks about the, the great procession that was there to greet him. It was a huge deal. For 100 years, they would remember the return of Cabeza de Vaca into Mexico City. And then just as a throwaway line, he talks about that behind them marched 500 Native Americans in chains. <laughs> like, he, he, he continues to acknowledge the existence of the slavery. And he's... I, Again, he, he's, not an, he's, not a, he's not a saint. <laughs> he's not even an ideologue per se. What he may have been was just the ultimate civil servant and that he was just sticking to the letter of the law as it was written. So I don't know, it's nuanced and it's, it's hard to know where to come down on it. Yeah. We have a few more minutes, uh, about five or so for questions. Uh, I just wanted to know, uh, I, I noticed that you used the uh, one uh, route. So have the scholars settled route? <laughs> yeah, so... Um, no. <laughs> Um, uh, th and actually, I don't even agree 100 percent with this route, but this was the better the better map. Um, so, in the 30s, oh, what was that UT professor's name? Anyway, uh, the, like the route that I, that I grew up with in my, in my textbook, kind of had Cabeza de Vaca striking out out this way, right? Just across Texas. Um, the, there was a, a Mexican historian with a German last name, Kruger. Who, who did some, some work after, actually, I think it might have been in the 50s that he did his work, but it's only slowly trickled up. I, I, I'm more convinced by, by Kruger's work, which actually has them trailing down this way and, and then kind of kicking up this way. And, and in a way, this makes a lot more sense because this is where they're trying to get, right? And so they knew that if they stayed along the coastline, that they should probably get there. Now, the weird part, you still have to explain this turn. And if you go to my podcast, you can listen to my theories, but I, it's... It's, uh, it's, it, it's hard to understand. Ultimately, they, they were lost, <laughs> you know, and, and they didn't really know where they were going. No, they haven't settled on the roots. There's, Texas State has uh, several professors that have written cool stuff on it, including they have a professor of astronomy yeah. or physics or something. Olson, what's his name? Or? Yeah, I think yeah, it is. Yeah, we start, we actually, we uh, work with them to create that, the three routes that you talked yeah. about. Yeah, okay. Was, well, he was the astronomer and he's a nice guy. Uh, so I, that's why I was curious. Well, and, it, well, but Olson's a critical part of this route because he, he, he's proven pretty convincingly that, that there's a kind of pine nut that Cabeza de Vaca describes in his account, a thin-shelled pine nut that really you, you, is only found kind of in, in the, the Sierra del, uh, del Burro up in northern Coahuila up there. Um, and, 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 and it certainly, it, and I've, so I've spent a lot of time, you know, I've, I've worked in, in this part of the world for the last 20 years. And like, th th this sounds right to me too, because then he talks about too finding a bunch of iron slag like, and, and that was always a problem for the people that kind of took the, the Fort Davis 
uh, route because you don't really have that much iron slag. You have a ton of iron slag right, right through here. I mean, it's, it's, it's Moklova. It's, it's the, the old mill town. So anyway, short answer, no. <laughs> There's no consensus on it, but um, I, I, I'm generally inclined toward more or less this route here. So yes, sir. Oh, sorry. I know he talks about the, cattle, the grasslands in this San Antonio area being the finest cattle lands he'd ever seen for grass. And then he nearly bled to death. He talked about many times trying to pick firewood, which was sort of the brush of the hill country. But I don't remember anything that seemed similar in Mexico that would divert him way down that way. He kind of kept going toward Colorado, you know, and he kept, talked about finding gourds in the, in the river that were basically, they wouldn't know where the gourds came from, so they considered them the most precious possessions with these gourds. And so he would be given gourds all the time because that was the most precious thing they had because they thought it was something from God. That's right. And so the, the, the gourds, they think, were coming from this culture right here, settled at the Junta de los Rios, you know, which had, had almost 10,000 people, one estimate, at the time the Cabeza de Vaca came through there. And, th and this, by the way, most people do agree that, that this point was a point they came through. Like, it's everything here where, where, it, gets, where it gets fuzzy. Um, and so the, the point about the grasslands, so he does describe those. And, and, for a long, and, and for a long time, the evidence that people used was the, the buffalo. They, you know, he talks about buffalo, too. And, 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 and for a while, the, the thinking was that the range of the buffalo never extended much below San Antonio. But they have since established that, that in, in different climactic periods, including this one, the buffalo would range all the way down in, into this part of the area, which, which, which opens that up, too. And, and, and in talking about the, the brush country again, too, for, for a long time, the, 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 they used some of the, the piñon, the, the, the pines that were up here, as the evidence. But, but, but they're, they're thick skilled, they're thick skinned, they're thick skinned. And this was Olson's argument anyway, that, that, that a better fit is, is these here in Northern Coahuila, so. Well, the, the native Indians in this area talk about this was a turnaround zone for the, 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 uh, the animals, the seasonal pests. They would come down and spend their winters in the grasslands and yeah. turn around and go back up, up the grasslands up to Canada, yeah. and they would do that every year back and forth, and this is where they turned around. That's why they thought it was so religious an area, because this was a turnaround area. Sure, and there's some, some great sites, you know, up by uh, MacArthur High School and stuff like that, you know, that were, have been sites for thousands of years, you know, where they would, they would sometimes run them off the cliffs and, and the stuff like that, and so, yeah, uh, the, the, the route is not conclusive. I mean, yeah, no, no one knows quite for sure. I mean, it, well, put it back, no one's quite sure about everything in here. From, from here on, it seems clearer, and, and this seems, seems clearer, but yeah, it's kind of in between. It's, because either way, it's hard to decide. Like we said, we, we knew he had some idea that he needed to come this direction, so why in the world did they, in either way, whether they went like this or whether they went like this, why did they turn northwest? I don't know. It's hard to figure out. Part of my argument is that I think they were just being carried along by their followers at that point. They had basically... Encomendado. They had handed themselves over to God, over to their, their ministry, and they were just going where, where they were being taken at that point. It was a part of his nakedness again. A part of his vulnerability and openness was just handing himself over to wherever he was being called to go. Well, in his reports, he was always talking about trying to get to Mexico City. That was the whole purpose. So I was shocking he would continue to go in a reverse direction. I agree. It's weird. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Listen, thank you very, so much for a fascinating story. I, thank you all. <laughs> Cabeza de Vaca has always been one of the, the, the most really compelling stories of, of Texas and travelers that I've ever heard in my life. And the fact that he survived even the hardships once he went back to Spain uh, is a story unto itself. So thank you very much. Appreciate it.